Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Uh, today is our 10-year celebration as a church. I hope that you'll join us. 10.30 a.m., we're going to have one combined worship service at our church. And then afterwards, we're going to have food. We're going to have fun out on the front lawn in front of our administration building, the AKA the big house. So I hope you plan on joining us um, if you're in the area and can do so. Uh, today, we're beginning the book of James. And James, the book of James is such a very, very important book for us. Um, it, it encourages us to make sure that we're living out our faith, that we, we, have, we have works that that actually are in line with our faith. Kind of almost like John the Baptist said to all the kind of the self-righteous, uh, you know, the religious people that came out to see him as he was baptizing people. And he said, you know, repent and, uh, and, and align your lives with, with repentance. You know, line up. If you say you believe in Jesus, you got to live like it. And that's what the book of James says. And let me, let me give you the introduction here in the book of James. Uh, just for context, okay, James, one of the brothers of Jesus, okay, so he was he was intimately close with Jesus, is one of his brothers became and he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' death and resurrection. And so that's a pretty incredible thing. He becomes the leader in Jerusalem. He was respected for the advice he gave and for the wise decisions he helped the community of believers to make. And at one point, he decided to write down some of his best teachings and advice and send them to other Jewish believers in Jesus who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And what he wrote to them has become known as the book of James. And so he's writing to believers who had been scattered, um, you know, throughout the Roman Empire. OK, uh, many of them because of persecution and things like that. So this book begins like a letter because it's being sent to people at a distance but it's actually not very much like other letters of the time. It's a collection of, sh of short sayings and slightly longer discussions of practical topics. And the conversational style, the short pit, uh, pithy sayings and the interweaving of themes all make this book similar to the wisdom writing found in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So there's a lot of wisdom that's contained in the book of, of James. And like those wisdom books, James concentrates on questions of daily living and God's good creation. He considers such practical issues as concern for the poor, responsible, responsible use of wealth, control of the tongue, purity of life, unity in the community of Christ followers, and above all, patience and endurance during times of trouble. The godly wisdom here remains as value, a valuable guide to living human, fully human lives as when James first shared it centuries ago. So let's read it together. James 1 and 2 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms, its blossoms falls, and its beauty is destroyed. And in the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, grown, gives birth to death. 
Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all for moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, And so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceives themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world? to be rich in faith, and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one says, one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Uh, But, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. You show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person who is considered righteous by what they, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Uh, This is such an important chapter. Um, Yeah, there are a lot of people that kind of dispense with it. And they were like, because they they stand on, you know, it's grace alone, grace alone that we are saved by grace. And yes, we're saved by grace. It is the grace of God. 
It's not the work of man. It's the grace of God. But the reality is, is we are saved by grace through what? Through faith. And our faith is made known. The truth about our faith, not just what we say. The truth about our faith is made known by what we do. So faith without works is useless. It's a dead faith. And there are a lot of people that walk around like, yeah, I have faith in God. I believe in God and I've got faith and, you know, but, but their life doesn't match it. And that's exactly where, what he, he's using this example of, and, and he, he even goes as far as to say, you know, a, a body without a soul is, is dead. It, it's, it's useless. It's same thing. A, a person with a, has faith, but, but has no works. It's useless. And we're deceiving ourselves into thinking that we have some kind of faith, you know, that is going to actually save us because it's a useless faith. Um, you know, the, the grace of God is shown by the faith that we live, that we live out. And so this is really extremely like, I just want to encourage you again, make sure when you're going through this, make sure you're underlining. I mean, look at, look at my Bible. I mean, you know, there's, there's like tons of underlining here underline in this thing because it's there are important things here that are that are being written for us to really really bring into our lives and um and i just want to encourage you make sure that you're you're really letting these things stand out and stick in your heart all right let's read psalm 50 now uh, psalm 50 it says the mighty one god the mighty one god the lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets from Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him and around him a tempest rages. He summons the, the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me this consecrated people who made, made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness for he is a God of justice. Listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God, and I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of a goat from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call on me in the day of, day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. But to the wicked person, God says, "You, what right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? You hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join in with him and throw in your lot with adulterers. You, you use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You sit and testify against your brother and slander your own mother's son. When you did these things and I kept silent, you thought I was exactly like you. But now, but I now arraign you and set my accusations before you. Consider this, you who forget God. Or I will tear you to pieces with no one to rescue you. Those who sacrifice thank offerings honor me. And to the blameless, I will show my salvation. Well, if that doesn't connect with what we just read in James uh, chapter 1 and 2, I don't know what does. Um, just in this, this God calling out the mighty one from, uh, from, his, uh, from his mountain, calling out to us what to live, to live righteously, to, to live to not say one thing and do another, but to live a, a righteous life, to, to let our, our, our deeds match what we say our faith is. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the call that you've given to us to, to live our lives in such a way that, that faith impacts our behavior, that faith, our faith and our deeds match up, God. And I pray that you would help us to live out this call, this this life of salvation in such a way that, that people will see the truth about the, our beliefs. They'll see it in the way that we live, in the way that we act, the way we treat other people, the way that we, that we uh, move away from 
temptation and move away from sinfulness and we move towards you, towards goodness, and we live according to your precepts and your ways. So Lord, help us to do that. God, and it's all by your grace. It's all by your goodness that we're even invited into this new life. So Lord, help us to live a transformed life. God, not even because we have to, but because we want to, we desire to, because we love you, God. And because we love you, we want to live for you. Lord, for those who don't want to live for you, Lord, help them to really get it gripped in their heart that it must really be that they don't love you because they don't want to live for you. Lord, I pray you'd convict them, convict their hearts that, that their lives are not, their hearts are not in the right place. And it's because of that that their lives are not in the right place. But God, help us to live with our hearts and our lives completely aligned for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Looking forward to uh, to jumping in and finishing up the book of James tomorrow. And, uh, and, and then after that, we're going to be jumping into another incredible book, the book of Joshua. Okay. So we're jumping in, alternating books, o- Old Testament, New Testament, back into Old Testament, back to New Testament. So, all right. Well, we'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful day.